All right. Welcome again to those of you online and welcome to those of you here in Kellen Auditorium at the New School. I'm Mark Frazier. I'm the co-director of the India China Institute, and it's my great privilege and honor to introduce to you our speaker for tonight, who is Sarah Jane, our postdoctoral fellow this year, uh, concluding a very successful, wonderful year at the Institute and at the New School as our, our postdoctoral fellow in the Cities and Citizenship Research Cluster. Um, she has been working on her dissertation project, uh, whose title uh, is uh, identical to the talk that she'll be giving uh, this evening, Fluvial Government, Tracking Petroleum as Liquid Infrastructure in India. Uh, it's a dissertation that examines oil, as the title suggests, oil as an infrastructure that mediates relations between state and society, and is based on two years of field work that she spent, uh, uh, including ethnography and interviews at oil refineries, ports, research institutes, state offices, and the Perry urban working class neighborhood of Napapur near Delhi. She is a 2022 PhD graduate of Columbia University's Anthropology Department. And it has been really a delight uh, to have her at the Institute this year, as I said. Uh, in addition to working on her, her research project, she organized uh, what for me was a really innovative and creative and really memorable series of talks uh, com compressed over a two-week period, four talks in late February and early March uh, entitled Flows, Infrastructure, and Citizenship in India and China, uh, which featured four conversations uh, by scholars doing field work in China and India. And you can view those anytime you wish uh, on the website at the India China Institute and our YouTube channel. Uh, she invited um, uh, faculty here at the New School uh, who moderated those uh, panels, including Emma Park, Alexandra Delano, and Antina von Smitzler. And we we're very um, grateful to the three of them and to Sarah herself because she moderated one of those panels too. So for today's talk on fluvial government, we're very fortunate to have Professor Rohan D'Souza. He is a professor in the Graduate School of Asian and African Studies at Kyoto University. And before that, he was at the Center for Studies in Science and Policy at JNU in Delhi. And as we were just talking, he, he mentioned that uh, the center engaged in studies that were far more exciting and were not really about science or policy. Um, but uh, his current work is on uh, reconceptualizing uh, rivers in South Asia. He has numerous books and publications. He publishes widely both uh, in terms of scholarship and in terms of uh, public engagement uh, on environmental history, science and technology studies, colonial history. He gave a talk here. Some of you have been at the New School long enough, uh, and I'm barely among them. I arrived in 2012. He gave a talk here in 2013 uh, that was hosted, in fact, by uh, our colleague, Mandri Mahajan, who's my fellow co-director at the India China Institute. And uh, as it turns out, uh, Rohan was uh, Dr. Jane's uh, infill advisor at JNU, so we have him in part to thank for, uh, I think, um, you know, encouraging and supporting uh, research uh, from, I believe it was water into flows and petroleum, uh, other, other material that flows other than water. So I will uh, turn it over to Dr. Jane in a moment. For those of you who are online, uh, please uh, feel free to, at any time, drop a, a question or comment in the Q&A uh, box, and we will get to it uh, after we hear from Dr. Jane and Professor D'Souza's comments on the talk. Thank you very much, and please uh, join me in welcoming uh, both uh, Dr. Jane and Professor D'Souza. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for so much for being here, for taking out the time to engage with me. Thank you to audiences on Zoom joining in from various places and time zones. I also want to thank ICI, uh, Mark, Manjuri, Anna, Chris, and others for organizing this and for such a supportive environment. Too. Finally, I cannot thank Rohan enough um, for coming all the way to be my discussant. We go back a long way and uh, we're meeting today after eight years. I owe debts of several lifetimes 
uh, for all the mentoring and advice that Ronnie has provided me. So today I will present an overview of my project and its broad arc by briefly introducing the different arguments I'm making and the concepts that I'm working with. I will now have time to delve into any of them in detail and will provide just the overarching view because I'm interested at the moment in figuring out how it all sits together. I must confess that I have done two projects in one, which could be entirely separate dissertations, one on oil refining from an SDS perspective and another on oil consumption from a state studies perspective. I will present both because I do bring them together. I'm happy to get into details during Q&A, so feel free to ask me to explain something better. All right, so my project investigates how oil becomes government, but also escapes government. I do this by tracking oil from its production to its consumption, based on ethnography in oil refineries and research institutes with engineers and government officials, and in the working class neighborhood called Nantibu, with black marketeers and ordinary consumers. I provide a fine-grained account of how refining operates in India to show how political possibilities get programmed into petroleum products. I show how the Indian state manufactures oil as a means to distribute itself into citizens' lives in the form of petroleum products that shape people's everyday lives and relations with the state. While I chart this link between fuel and state power, I also argue that neither the government nor engineers entirely control the system. They are first limited by the material properties of oil itself, and then by black marketeers and consumers who buy and use them in unauthorized ways, and state actors who facilitate this. So central to this project has been the examination of oil's disparate worlds of production and consumption in conjunction for understanding that oil is not tied only to state power and big capital, but is also imposed upon by caste and gender. I demonstrate that power is constituted differently at different points in the supply chain, and oil's relationship with power is not singular or monotonous. This is vital to understand how an energy regime is made and unmade, how it can be reformed, the layers, ways, and places in which it inserts itself socially, also getting reconfigured by sociocultural factors. So a, a few disclaimers before I get into my key arguments. India imports most of the crude oil that it refines as it does not have oil reserves and is therefore not a producer. But it has set itself up as a major refining destination of the world. Second, I use the term citizens instead of consumers and sometimes consumer citizens because in India, consumption of the petroleum product that I study, cooking gas, is based on residency papers and is provided only by state agencies and only to account holders with national IDs. You might also find my claim odd that petroleum consumption defines relations with the state, as one might ask where the state comes into this capitalist enterprise of oil companies. But most oil companies and refineries in India are state owned, and even private ones work closely with the petroleum ministry and adhere to its whims. There is no one state institution managing oil in India, Rather, it's an amalgamation of various state institutions at play together in making and in refining or uh, retailing oil. Finally, the two themes of oil refineries on the one hand and Gujar thugs, that is, um, black marketeers of the Gujar caste, on the other hand, do not appear connected. But plural substances establish unlikely connections rather sneakily. One way of thinking about oil is through energy, technopolitics, and infrastructure. This is far removed from caste, religion, and gender. My research shows how and where the two worlds collide. My initial research plan did not involve the study of caste, religion, and gender. I intended to study the ways in which oil acts as an infrastructure, how the Indian state proliferates itself through petroleum products that saturate the lives of Indian citizens, and how oil consumption structures everyday lives of ordinary people. 
enacting state agendas in their social and private worlds. While I did do this, my ethnography compelled me to think more expansively about the relationship between oil, the state, and the everyday. I constantly found myself being imposed upon by the phenomena of caste religion and gender while studying oil consumption, owing to its entanglements with illegalities and urban informality, which in turn are tied to local forms of power based on caste religion and gender. Thus, although I began this project tying oil primarily with state power and big capital, I constantly encountered social and cultural phenomena usually sequestered away from science and technology. Further, when I came to write about these distortions in oil and infrastructures engineered by local sociocultural phenomena, frameworks of insurgent and critical infrastructures were inadequate to understand how power operates through oil and how it is subverted, as were notions of the indigenization of otherwise centralized tools of power via subalternity and concepts such as weapons of the weak. None of these fully captured the reality I was encountering. This is because even as status and capitalist power gets distorted and diluted during oil consumption through black markets, it does not lead to democratization when it gets concentrated around dominant caste men who are the primary ones to gain from oil's escape from governmental discipline. Power is constituted differently at different points in a petroleum products journey. Studying this beckons us to explore the worlds of production and consumption simultaneously in order to attend to the tensions between the state strengthening the oil on the one hand and oil's escape from that discipline of the state and the capital on the other, and then to recognize that this distortion of discipline need not be a romantic or idealistic thing owing to the ultimate fabrication of power it rests on and further aids. So coming to my um, main discussion now. Fluvial government is in two parts, refining of production and consumption. The first part, manufacturing politics in oil refineries, shows how the micro processes of refineries fold politics into the petroleum products produced to argue that they are inherently political inventions. Questioning the ontological givenness of oil and unpacking the systems that produce it together allow me to answer the question about the politics of petroleum. Describing the step-by-step -step process of oil refining, I demonstrate that petroleum products are invented and not natural, deriving their politics from an intricate combination of crude oil's materiality, the technical processes of refining, and the hidden human decisions shaping them. The difference between kerosene and liquefied petroleum gas, or LPG, both used for cooking in India provides an example of how decisions are embedded in petroleum products and what that implies for their users. So as a liquid, kerosene can be divided and shared by consumers. It can be inhaled to alter states of consciousness or added to dilute expensive diesel with devastating environmental effects. Easily accessible and movable, its consumption is freed from state grids and is not surveilled. Its alternate uses and black market are a source of menace for the Indian government. This allows the sustenance of informal society central to politics and sociality across urban India. Yet it remains subsidized as mass protests have accompanied attempts to remove the subsidy. LPG being gases is not divisible by consumers and its large cylinders are difficult to share, disabling neighborly sociality. It can be purchased only from government dealers and requires a biometric ID, a bank account, a phone number, and a fixed address. It demands an integration of users into networks of the state, brokering different relations with the state from those of kerosene. One involves mass protest on revoking the subsidy and solidarity via sharing. The other involves individual consumption and regulation. One has the state addressing a population through a mass subsidy, the other has the state addressing individuals through biometrics. 
One is a tool for people to hold the government accountable. The other turns oil provision into technical arrangements outside politics to consolidate governmental power. Kerosene is social and fugitive, while LPG is individualized and detectable. Piped natural gas coming into private kitchens via pipes takes individual consumption to a higher level, as LPG cylinders can still be moved between homes, but piped gas coming directly to the kitchen cannot be shared at all. Its metered usage also alters the relations between consumers and providers. Piped gas and LPG create rationing subjects, whereas kerosene and other fuels do not subjectify citizens in such minute ways. Factors responsible for these social effects are both decisions regarding the materiality of these substances and decisions regarding their mode of distribution. These decisions are made within the international oil industry. This is a simplified diagram of a very complex refining process. So investigating the places and moments where decisions are made and uh, where decisions are made allowed me to argue that petroleum products can be different, had different priorities been encoded into them, and those would have different environmental and sociopolitical effects. I investigate which factor or actor acts where and how to make oil as we know it, how it could be different, and what the politics of how these factors interact is. Closely examining the refining system and the mechanical arrangements within the refinery also sheds new light on the complex relationship between a material, a mechanical arrangement, and human decisions. Investigating this tension between these actors is fundamental to locating environmental and ethical responsibility in systems with spread out agency. I do this by distinguishing between agency and accountability and between what I term action-taking agency and decision-making agency. So here are a few examples of what goes on in a refinery and what I mean by different factors or actors with different agencies. An earthquake with a high magnitude forces a complete shutdown on a refinery because it was not built to resist earthquakes of that magnitude. During a technical problem, an engineer gets a call in the middle of the night to troubleshoot, but he's too sleepy to solve it. Two engineers argue about whether the sound of the vibration from an equipment in the plant is abnormal or possible because their senses perceive it differently. A port captain prays for preventing the oncoming storm from creating obstacles in unloading a ship carrying crew. A stock of diesel is behaving unexpectedly in the hydrotreater, and engineers in the control room cannot understand what parameters they should change to make it work. Neither can engineers in the physical plan from what's visible and audible to them. They pray to the gods' pictures, pasted onto their control panels and equipment for giving them answers before it becomes dangerous. The government is nearing elections and orders the refinery to produce more cooking gas so it can freely distribute cylinders and win the public's loyalty and votes, altering the refinery's rhythms and plans. On the face of it, these are all occasions that may result in accidents, or they are all moments in the everyday life of a refinery. But they have more in common. They're all examples of the interaction between different factors in petroleum production. The mechanical administrative system interacts with the subjective experience and the daily life of an engineer, with the material autonomy of oil that is always throwing surprises at engineers and giving them puzzles to solve, and with the external environment, be it climatic, geophysical, political, or social. They are all also examples of where and how humans make decisions, which have long-lasting impacts, not just on the refinery, but on the products as well. How do these different components of petroleum production impinge on each other on a daily basis? How are the variations in these factors managed? And how are they brought together to co-produce exactly the same petroleum products each time? Part one addresses these questions by paying close attention to the minutiae of everyday life 
of the numerous sites of oil production. Deconstructing oil and the systems it is produced through is crucial to understand the myth of its naturalness, which affords immense power to its makers. Petroleum products do the bidding of their producers in the lives of their consumers. And this could look very different as they are not natural and can take on a different shape. So how does the politics programmed into petroleum products in refineries actually play out once other actors intervene and snatch control over oil away from the state? Despite this, how does it still discipline citizens in particular ways by patterning their consumption and everyday life, as well as mainly sociality and relations with state providers? Moving away from SDS frameworks and towards the anthropology of infrastructure and the anthropology of the state, the second part of the project, the double life of an LPG cylinder, discusses oil consumption in Nazi work. It explains how a petroleum product structures people's quotidian lives and the competing sovereignties that mark this process. I focus on LPG provided only via accounts based on numerous citizenly documents. I probe what I call distorted discipline, where governmental plans of bringing citizens onto state grids get mangled by the informal practices of state actors as well as citizens, while still enacting some of that original disciplinary government it was meant for. Focusing on legalized and illegalized markets of LPG, I track the networks of local power based on caste and gender that bring control over LPG out of the state's hands. By discussing the modus operandi of the thriving black market of LPG run by Gujar men, uh, Gujar being the locally dominant caste, I describe how state power and caste power interact over the body of oil, how both deploy LPG to extend their power, and how infrastructures get influenced by the caste that controls them. This highlights the churning between the state and citizens through ever evolving devices of government, as well as through escape from them. Now, what is the average Indian's everyday experience with the state? When the state first actively makes people dependent on itself for basic services and needs, which they previously fulfill themselves, such as cooking fuel, and then does not deliver on them, how do people engage or abandon the state. Parto describes and analyzes how Indian citizens deal with the frustrating experience that the Indian governmental bureaucracy is. When they draw the state in and force it to work for them, when they bend backwards to access whatever little they can get from it, and when they abandon and escape it instead. This part describes the modalities of power and networks that emerge in these processes and what already exists for people to deploy for these processes. I analyze how this negotiation over the body of an infrastructure, that is LPG, shapes the relationship between the Indian state and citizens that, you know, that they share, the forms of subjectification and citizen making that arise from this infrastructure provision, the extent to which they are successful, and how they also end up molding the state in unintended ways. So analyzing the tussle between the state and citizens, I arrive at the notions of peopled infrastructure, the infrastructure as an object of and terrain for negotiation, patrolling citizenship and outlaw sovereignty. I discuss what it means for an infrastructure, the state, citizens and their relationship when an infrastructure is heavily constituted by the labor of people. I dwell on the idea that infrastructures in India are objects of desire, while also being terrains over which citizens display resistance, but in no confrontational manner. Instead, they use small acts of evasion or demand. The negotiation between the state and citizens occurring over the body of an infrastructure becomes central to their relationship to the formation of the state and of citizens. And Tina von Schnitzler was at the New School, and whose work I'm so inspired by, discusses infrastructures in South Africa as terrains of struggle. And my research shows that in India, it is not struggle, but negotiation. So I do borrow her phrasing. I introduce the idea of a patrolic citizenship that is different from other beneficiary citizenships 
and has specifically to do with petroleum products. Introducing the concept of outlaw sovereignty, a technically illegal source of power vested in individuals who lord over their co local communities, deriving their power from their caste and gender and honing it through machismo and masculinity. I argue that the escape from discipline of formal services and infrastructures must not be celebrated as democratic resistance to state and capitalist forces, because those infrastructures get mired in alternate hierarchies. It is crucial to investigate who gains power through that escape from state and capitalist discipline and what the form of that power is. So summing up, because oil is turned into several different petroleum products, all offering a range of political possibilities because of their materialities, and all of those ranges stretched by the imaginations and activities of consumers, the politics of oil cannot be pegged neatly in any one box. The same can be said for several other infrastructures because of their nature of being open to varied appropriations. Different infrastructures, nonetheless, offer different ranges to which they can be distorted and mangled, depending on how peopled they are, how negotiable they are, the social structures they land on, and the material affordances that they lend in the first place. These are the things I have investigated regarding oil in India across different sites. Oil in India can be seen as a flickering reality, to borrow Hassan Harvey's term, by different ways of relating with it produce different realities, none of which are stabilized. It is akin to a lenticular photograph, again, Prasenaj's term, in which the same surface encapsulates within it multiple possible outcomes, depending on which perspective one relates to it from. This lenticularity, nonetheless, is not infinite. It is circumscribed by the material and social forces that created which become crucial to examine for understanding just what the politics of an infrastructure are, even if they appear as a range. So what I'm proposing here isn't just an argument about oil or about the Indian government, but a framework of how to and what ought to research in an infrastructure. At every point in the life cycle of a gallon of crude turning into a petroleum product, it can be turned into something other than what is eventually decided about it. At every point in the life cycle of that petroleum product, it can be stored, distributed, sold, and used in ways other than what are eventually adopted. Each set choice congeals within it a set of possibilities. By opening a window into these possibilities, I have attempted to articulate where and how the Indian state meets Indian citizens over the body of oil, what the nature of that interaction is, how it also leads to unplanned phenomena, and what the nature of those are. In the cyclical loop of systemic, social, human, and material agencies influencing one another, detailed out in part one, I have demonstrated how a careful ethnography of the technical and of my new details, choices, and processes considered extraneous or peripheral help me arrive at the human decisions responsible for manufacturing petroleum products in the ways that they are eventually launched in the world. Through this, I've tried to present a lucid picture of the complicated technical network through which oil travels from its drilling or unloading points to its final destination in the consumer's home or vehicle, as well as details about the many risks and uncertainties that mark this process. Despite the constraints of the material process, what happens in the refinery is not entirely technologically determined. Humans make decisions that lend politics to eventual outcomes. Despite highlighting human agency, I have shown that systems are not fully under human control. In this flux and movement of agency between the human and the non-human, how do we establish accountability? Despite recognizing the diffusion of agency, by distinguishing between agency and accountability, I have argued for bringing in a normative and ethical dimension to assemblages for addressing the anti-politics of actor networks in assemblage thinking. After establishing that petroleum products are political inventions 
and can be made and used differently, I'm in a position to study how they are made and used by the Indian government. Part two has illustrated the manner in which the governmental regime in India deploys LPG as an infrastructure for control, visibility, and votes. Part two also completes where part one started, researching the many aspects, social and material, productive and consumptive, of an infrastructure to get at its political range. I argue that LPG provision is a nation building exercise in that it first creates a body of people who are identified and included on the basis of their belonging to the nation via IDs, and then links them to the state for their daily existence in intimate ways. Roads, tunnels, dams, and other such infrastructures do not need identification cards and serve people without them. The cooking fuel is an indispensable item of everyday life and has been tied to a system of ideas. Not to forget that citizens are made to invest their labor and sociality in procuring LPG cylinders. This binding of the state with the nation, that is the people, and inclusion of the citizens' labor in making the state work has served to strengthen the state and make individuals responsible for it. I argue that highly distributed and networked infrastructures and people infrastructures have this quality built into them as they necessarily require many non-state actors to invest themselves in it in order for them to function. An entrepreneurial citizen can make the infrastructure and the state work for them by inserting themselves into it and investing their labor in it to get its benefits. When that becomes the means to success and more of aspiration, each citizen develops a stake in maintaining the order of the infrastructure and the state. This is why, despite the difficulty of paperwork and physical labor, many people who want to be seen as a part of a developed nation and not as those who come in its way, insert themselves in the legal LPG account system to get onto the grid. This infrastructure requires that work of them. That is the only way for it to make it work. And once it does, it renders them improved while fully serving the state. However, the leeway delivery men and LPG agencies have in the endpoint delivery of the infrastructure and service, the sabotage it is vulnerable to by outlaw sovereigns or black marketeers and ordinary citizens tends to frustrate this aspiration of a developed nation state distorts the discipline the infrastructure was meant to trigger and distributes power and sovereignty to forces outside the state and big capital. I argue that this contradiction is inherent in people's infrastructures, compelling citizens to invest in and work with the state on the one hand, but allowing them to escape that discipline as well. Finally, I'd like to highlight the question of justice, agency, and accountability brought up in part one that is resurrected in part two. Fluvial government has attempted to highlight the differential agency of all actors, human and non-human, and also hold all human actors accountable, whether in refineries, in the government, or in markets. Questions of equitability, environment, safety, affordability, access, and largely of democracy are not applicable only to refinery engineers and policy makers, but also the small LPG agency owners and employees, as well as outlaw sovereigns and black marketeers. It is in the process of holding them accountable to the injustices that they perpetuate that have confronted the romantic notion of insurgent infrastructures, which glosses over the absence of ethics and equity in the insurgency. So spread across diverse people's lives in pervasive ways, oil enables big capital and states to influence how people live and think. To examine how control operates in mundane ways, fluvial government has researched what these powers intend with oil, what in oil allows them, and the things people do with it. Through this, I hope to have illustrated how state control updates itself using newer means, how people respond, and the parallel structures of power that they rely on and create. Analyzing the relationship between the sociocultural and the political, I've demonstrated how oil is a part of the social world and how the state is, through oil, a part of this world. And through that, 
I hope to have provided a framework for how to study an infrastructure and a network system politically. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, Sandra, for a very, very uh, good presentation. But I have to start by saying I'm really honored to be here and not because I was previously uh, Sandra's mentor and she was my student, but because there is a role shift today. Uh, it is like uh, Sandra has delivered a lecture and I'm the student now who must summarize and somehow uh, make an insight that is meaningful. Yeah? And I want to declare at the start itself that I've always been a rocky student. And uh, I think today I'm going to even cheat a bit by saying that I'm not sticking entirely to the script that Sarandar presented because I've also read her PhD, uh, at least two thirds of it, like any bad student, not the whole thing, but enough to, you know, uh, I think, uh, um, <clears throat> develop on some of the insights we've given. Yeah? But uh, let me start by saying this, that um, uh, if one actually looks at what Sarna's project is about, in my opinion, it's there in the first two pages of the introduction. And it's a very sudden uh, uh, introduction because uh, she starts with uh, the COVID and the fact that there was a point uh, when the price of oil actually knows that. And all the tankers were actually looking around for ports to dump and nobody was interested in oil. And Sandra writes that, and this, it's beautifully done, but uh, and I, I would ideally like to read it, but maybe I should just uh, give my version of what she says. And she says at some point that um, uh, everyone knew that in this crisis that oil would come back. People would start buying. People, we we depend on it. We would we would get uh, back to the old groove of using oil, but at for a brief while, what happened was the unthinkable happened. That a world without oil could be imagined. And she writes at one place there that uh, everything stopped, but the world did not end. All right. And I was struck uh, with uh, two aspects of this. One is. Uh, I had uh, somewhere, uh, and I, you know, given uh, given uh, my age now, I'm not required to remember the exact uh, quote and citation. But I think at some point, uh, James Ferguson says that it's harder for us to imagine. It's easier for us to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. Yeah. So I was struck that what Sandra is doing here is something similar. Her work really, her PhD, the flow and the arguments are trying to push this idea of thinking about a world without oil, imagining a world without oil. And um, it's like saying, uh, you know, if you expect fish to theorize about water, right? It's always problematic. It's so much common sense. All our world is soaked in this thing called oil. And for us to think outside of it is uh, almost impossible, if not complicated. Similar to asking fish that if there is, you know, how do you theorize about water? And if there's no water, what happens to you? Well, according to ecol uh, well, e evolutionists, uh, the fish actually come out of water and become amphibians and then move on to land. So everything doesn't just end when something that is such an important common sense everyday aspect of life suddenly disappears and you would think that that should end, yeah? Uh, but it's, uh, it's much more uh, graded and more complicated and so on and so forth. So let me, uh, having said that, uh, there are three or four aspects of your project uh, that I find very striking. First is your PhD has a very, literary quality to it. It's, it's a literary quality because there are aspects of it which are just profound. Uh, it's like, uh, you know, uh, car mechanics fix cars, uh, but um, a physicist, uh, you know, theorizes the nature of movement itself. Yeah? So there's aspects of your PhD 
So I thought you bring a literary quality to explain and express a profound understanding. Uh, and I think that is really uh, very striking, very extraordinary uh, in this effort. Yeah, so uh, I should say that uh, that profoundness is so central to helping us imagine a life beyond oil. And especially given the stresses that are on oil production today, I think 2023 is also a very significant year because uh, renewables now are not just caught up, but I think the investment in renewables now far exceed the investment in oil. Yeah, I think 2023 is when that happens. So it's not that uh, uh, we are looking at oil uh, as this incredibly uh, 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 powerful sort of energy regime that cannot be imagined at least out being, being no longer that 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 uh, centralized position. So, uh, in certain ways, I think if one puts your uh, PhD effort in that context, then two or three things are happening. One is you are you had a shock event called COVID. Suddenly, people have begun to be thinking of you know. Uh, a kind of moment that is very different from how they've led their lives around oil. Second, that you've got this whole revolution in renewables happening. Of course, there's lots of complications, issues of power. Oh, did I switch something on? Okay. Uh, uh, issues of power and hierarchy and so on and so forth. But um, uh, despite that, you can, there is a lot of talk today that you know, oil is not sustainable because of climate change, global warming, and so on and so forth. And we've got to come out of that. So given that, one of the most important things to be doing is not just the statistics and the logistics of what oil is about, but how to push an imagination of a different world. And I think I would locate your PhD effort in that exercise. And you've used very skillfully uh, almost, I would say, weaponized words, meanings, and language to do that. Yeah. So I, I found that extremely spiking and 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 extremely and encouraging. So here's the larger plot line, which I think you've spelled out, but I'm just going to repeat it and hoping that I've touched the right notes in this. One is that uh, as infrastructure, oil is an invention. It's an invention because politics makes oil emerge as petroleum, as different substances, and that all these, the, the making of oil itself is always contingent and subject to various kinds of instability. And that's what making does. So it's not, as you say at some point, it's not a given ontological fact, but something that is constantly made and recreated through effort. Yeah? Now, when you're making something, of course, things go wrong, things can get dangerous, and you never realize the outcomes you always intended or desired. Yeah? And so that, that aspect is there when you discuss infrastructure. But then you bring in a second layer to this. When you talk about everyday lives, uh, one is you, you, you suggest, and that's also from your entry, I remember, that oil moves not just about collecting people at the top, big industry and states, but it also colonized everyday worlds. And if the everyday worlds is where people can uh, turn it around, uh, sort of, uh, you know, in some ways escape its, its disciplinary powers and its implications, then that also becomes a basis for us to unsettle the capacity for oil. Yeah? And therefore, if people can uh, use oil in different ways, they can also perhaps become renewable, we don't know, yeah, right? So uh, the end result of what I gather from your uh, PhD is that uh, the life world of oil can also end. It is not something that uh, is, uh, and it can end, life worlds can end simply because you can change your politics and your politics can be undermined. And the fact that uh, all the logics that go into making oil are inherently rooted in a lot of instabilities. And therefore, what you get is a very muscular world of oil, but a very fragile one as well. 
Yeah, and I thought that comes across very well in the way you, you bring in uh, all those dimensions. But now, uh, a bad student need not be a psychopath. So I'm going to have a few things to quickly do. Yeah, okay. One is, uh, I felt that your title is not appropriate to what you are saying. So it is not uh, a fluvial government, uh, sorry, again, old age, old age. Okay, okay, it's not, it's not fluvial government because your thesis suggests that oil is sticky, it is gooey, and it is fire that is on water. You know, you can literally light oil. Yeah, so it's not, it's not got a, it's not got the sense of flow that, or fluvialness that I would associate with those words. Yeah, so actually, uh, therefore, fluvial government really doesn't capture what we're talking about. And government and state, sometimes I think you collapse it, uh, need not always do that. Uh, they are uh, based on different uh, rhythms and logics, yeah? Uh, if one was to use that word. So fluvial government tracking petroleum as liquid infrastructure in India, I think does not really uh, do justice to the PhD. What seems striking is the following, and I, and I, and I can't retitle it because I think that's, that's something you do much more brilliantly. But once, uh, once maybe the bad student gives this uh, criticism, maybe you might, might want to wonder. Uh, one is that uh, I think there is an end game of a life world. And somebody needs to write about it. And I think uh, an end game is usually revealed uh, best in a context where uh, there are uh, a, a set of populations or peoples who have been working around uh, oil uh, on an everyday world, even as they depend on it, even as they um, uh, uh, you know, as you correctly pointed out, they are not, this is not a romantic kind of subversion. This is reaffirmation of all kinds of hierarchies and inequality and injustice and so on and so forth. But the tricks and the techniques of um, working under and around the system, some of that is there in what you do, right? Yeah. So I would say the end game of a life world seems to be uh, a stronger theme than fluvial government. I did not get a sense in the, PhD, in the section that I've read and so on and so forth uh, of either of an over empowering government that is very confident that oil is everything and that's what we are going to persist with, nor did I get a sense that uh, everybody is going to have a buy-in all the time. Yeah, uh, but do life worlds end? And there's a reference you have to, um, uh, I forget, uh, it's, Watts is one of the authors that edited on the end of life, on, on life worlds, the spec, uh, uh, something on oil, subterranean something, and yeah, estates and the life worlds and yeah. But they use the word life worlds, so, you know. So I think, I think much of your PhD seems to be telling us that, uh, it is time that we try and imagine a world outside of all, yeah? And uh, it can be uh, not as impossible uh, as uh, maybe the end of capitalism for James Ferguson or the um, or theorizing uh, water for fish, but definitely there are aspects that seem to emerge today uh, that would trouble the confidence of the last 70, 80 years ago. Yeah? Um, and I think uh, if I was to um, steal your PhD, remove your, by the way, when you submitted, when you sent me the, the nine page note, your name was not on it. Yeah. And I was very tempted to publish it as another publication. You only show that. I mean, go to court, such a long game. Yeah. By then, yeah, the idea is there. But, uh, but yeah, if I was to just, uh, remove your name and publish it in my, I would change the title. And I would also really focus a great deal on saying that it is such a destabilizing moment 
for oil as an energy system, as a regime, that uh, it is now uh, not necessarily um, uh, being uh, uh, overconfident or cocky or, or, or trying anyway, being dramatic, but to actually speak of the end of a certain, certain aspect of, me, of that life. Yeah. And, um, you know, there is uh, this anthropologist at Hokkaido. Uh, her name is Suzanne Klein. I hope I got her name right. I think it is Suzanne Klein. Yeah. Who writes about uh, post growth, uh, people in post growth societies? in Japan, and there are many. And she writes about how these communities are building up of young people who've given up uh, on, 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 on development, on growth, because it's just gone under their skin, they're exhausted, they're tired. Anyway, there's no jobs, it's all, uh, you know, this is the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the precariats now uh, moving from, uh, all kinds of consultancies. And, and so many of them have kind of wandered off, uh, not necessarily uh, not necessarily with a sense of defeat uh, and not necessarily either with hope, but a sense of trying something new and different and getting out of you know, this, the kinds of ideas that would be common sense about what it is to be a, you know, a citizen or what it is to be uh, a person of a growth economy. Yeah? And so she, uh, what her book does, interestingly, is to, it's not necessarily there's an alternative, but in all these little defeats and tragedies and all these losses, somehow you get a sense of there is another picture, you know? And I'm just wondering uh, if that should be my next book based on, uh, uh, on, on, on uh, inspired by Peruvian government. I, I don't know if you get this joke, but, for a long time, Hindi movies would say inspired, but which they meant as copy, while copyright violations, yeah, right. So something to that effect, uh, I would, I would endanger. But, but I, I should end because I, otherwise, I, I can just go on indefinitely. But, but thank you very much, uh, Sandra, because I learned a great deal, uh, and much of it I read on the flight uh, here, which is saying a lot for someone who really watches those movies. Yeah, because I have a you know 14 year old daughter who owns a television in our house. This is my only option to watch a film. So it was riveting. I really, I'm almost, well, I should say, I, I'm envious of the way you use language. Yeah, it's really skillfully done, beautifully crafted in many places and so full of profoundness. And I wish I could have done that. I, you know, there's no way now it's, it's published, it's in your name. Yeah. So I guess I'll have to just admit this week and say thank you so much for a lovely uh, PhD and for this opportunity to speak. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you uh, for both the inspiring talk in the old sense of the word and the wonderful inspiring comments uh, that followed. Um, I think uh, rather than covering it a lot, you know, maybe just respond to what was just said, but maybe we take questions and if you want to refer back to what uh, points Rahan made, uh, that would be most fine. Um, so we, we have four questions that have come in uh, from the audience on Zoom. But since you're, you're here in the flesh, you, you get the priority first. So I'll open it up to our floor here uh, for questions. And great, we have a rolling mic so the people online can hear also. And if you wouldn't mind just letting us know your, your name, please. Yeah. Um, I'm Ivan. Um, I'm from I would like to hear more about your ethnography and how this business and or would theology came up uh, in that work in my neighborhood. I can't do the same. Sorry. And my major is what we call people that we have and I call for the invited on the Okay. 
I, I tried to track all the analytics for two weeks, you know, so that I um, and things go differently in spots, and there are spots for sensitivity, and, and there are spots for this pretty elusive. And I feel here also because I think Fluvia really testing will tend to escape the segment uh, much more easily than. Um, Sorry, so I'm using that metaphor also, which is not just a metaphor. The metaphor is actually very related to the material uh, truths of, of the substance, you know, like water that I've said in the book, or the um, oil, the oil to can escape the therapy. Um, and uh, Timothy Mitchell is not a democracy when he differentiates between coal and uh, oil and, and, and the possibilities of democracy that are being built with. Also tries to handle the you which know, what it is in oil that makes it different from, from coal and, and, and a lot of it has to do with that as too. So um that is why it's kind of um and government because I I think this is something that needs an application. I do always need it as a mind, but as a uh, verb. So you know, like when I say it's it takes government, uh, I'm not, I don't mean the state, I mean uh, the, the action of government. And so that's what I was going to do with him. Now I'm going to do it not with you. So, um, you know, the profoundly, it's really easy to believe that there is an office that is so highly automated and the technical operations are so standardized in management ways. It's very easy to believe that things just happen, you know, in this way, and that this is the result of some technological uh, evolutionary path that oil might be moving on that you know doing in here. And so and I'm always just is this way that you know when you think that crude in this nation common, you get these different uh, disciplines, and then you kind of lose sense of that, you know, that you do But um so that's why I have many visits to the science. Because in the first few, in the first visit, I was kind of just trying to learn what the people finding they must do. And then in the latter visits, I really found it and came back to why do you do it this way? Because that's when we are able to understand human decisions. That it doesn't actually have to be this way, that it, it's not just like so, for instance, when they uh, took me to the distillation knowledge, it's like, yeah, we keep oil to 580 degrees. Uh, but why 580? Why not 400 or 570 degrees? You know? And then they said, well, that's the temperature at which crude boils. So then I knew, okay, this is a material economy of crude, impinging on other factors. But when they say, for instance, in hydro it was shut down, it was starting up, and it was feeling the production was starting up. Uh, you know, they said something about running nitrogen through it, and I said, but why can't you run nitrogen in interest? So I asked why a lot of it. And then they said, well, it's nothing to do with like oil or product, it's just ours, it's the machines, and if the machines are different, we will be able to run it. And that would change the product. So these are the few examples of how when I ask why they do this way, how they do it. And I in it with the question why and why. It was that that was the only way to find out the human event of social. So um that is how they really kind of made the argument that this is really a political mesh. Um and it's it's not just uh there's also the difference between a process product and an invented product. And some people encourage me to not make the argument that it is invented, just say that it's process. But I mean, it's the invented because they have studied and measured, which I was able to understand a little bit in asking why we do this in this manner and what your decision would be, what would happen if you did it differently, or when there's a contingency. And you saw it this way, what could a different engineer do? And then what could be the result of it? So it's through those kinds of conversations that are really sort of arriving. And now, if you want 
was um, not so much about politics. Yeah, Matthew was really about um, relations with the state and their you know, relations with each other. It's about God, it's about all kinds of things where I was more free. And then, you know, in the beginning, I went to find out for me how it all starts to arrive. But they kept talking about the black market. And so then I just had to investigate that it's not about my relation to that point. Um, so then you know they kind of love the black market leaders and the yeah. so yeah, I was more suspicion of ethnography. Um yeah, I hope that answers that very well. Where we're getting uh um, yeah, someone online saying we come on. A little difficult to hear. They heard part of it, but so yeah, maybe it's fine. There you go. Hi, I'm Sean. Yeah, so uh, Antia, uh, when she talks about working leaders in South Africa, and she talks about how people are protesting, uh, not just working leaders, but she said you know, during the uh, political crisis, uh, there was a lot of uh, sabotage of uh, public infrastructure because people used it to, as a site of protest, and it became a site of struggle. An option entering a struggle is what she says. And what I saw, um, it was very inspiring for me, uh, her book, Democracy and Infrastructure. And then when I started thinking about the situation in India, um, I couldn't retrofit it, you know. Um, so, because what I, what I noticed is that A, LPG has been depoliticized. People are not like in, I think about a year or two ago, there was protest in Kazakhstan, massive protests about LPG prices. That simply doesn't happen in India, even though in India, LPG is the most expensive in the world, uh, imposed on, not awkwardly, but imposed on some of the poorest population. Yet there is no protest. There's no struggle because it's been depoliticized. Now, how are people finding ways to depoliticize? It's not through str outright struggle and protest. It's through small acts of evasion, um, small acts of Recalcitration. So, so it's you know they negotiate, and that's why I use the word negotiation because it is a back and forth with the LPG agency, their local sort of provider. Like either they negotiate about making processes easier for them to you know it's it's difficult all that bureaucracy and paperwork, especially for populations that are not literate. So you know making things easier for them, or uh, they go to the black market. And um, you know, so that's a different kind of negotiation or evasion. Um, or it's a you know, just like a constant like when when we access the um the LPG cylinder, that process itself is a negotiation. Why can't you come to my door? Why do I have to walk one or two miles to you know, so it's that kind of and you know that that image of uh, men and women. It's a 30 kilogram cylinder with the gas in it. It's heavy. And they, they pad their shoulders with something, and then they keep that on the shoulder and they're walking. Um, you know, that image was it was a compelling image of how the Indian state needs the Indian citizen. And and and, and the other way around, how the Indian citizen is constantly negotiating to make the state work. Because the state has not held its end of the bargain. You know, it should, it should be delivering at the door, this is a huge cylinder. So, and, and, and they're, they're constantly negotiating with the state about this. So, it gives different kinds of things through which the negotiation happens in different ways, um, which is what Martha Chatterjee describes as political society. So, uh, that's another sort of concept I, I use to describe Nazi work. And then, how infrastructures um, 
in um, in uh, are often in uh, in the sight of, of back and forth between the state and citizens. I'm really uh, not happy with the event. Uh, I think that was a good message in the talk. Uh, and I would really like to speak to Roman's point about uh, the mind world. Uh, you know, I, I'm wondering if uh, that, you know, shutting people, shutting new reality, you know, it provides a methodology to kind of work uh, where, and how does the limit of our reality, the limit of our quality, for example? Uh, that you're seeing by the way this might uh, kind of shape the you know, your movement in the field of what and deriving what you're trying to do. Um, so I'm curious to see how where, where you are, uh, how you are and can you both uh yeah. Thank you. Um uh, yeah, you know, in the beginning when I uh, when I started field work a little before that, I was yeah, my, my, my conceptual framework was mostly about government activity, that what I'm going to see in that work when I look at how all it structures people's everyday lives, what I'm going to find is another example of governmentality. Um, but I didn't, right? And uh, there was so much negotiation that was actually going on. It wasn't a one-way disciplinary process that, that I found. And I think this is the difference in the literature that is on the US on everyday consumption of oil products and literature. So there isn't that much literature on everyday life and oil. But when there is, it's mostly um, coming out of the West. And it's really about government. Different examples of how petroleum products have produced of the Korean governmentality in American citizens' lives or European citizens' lives, etc. But, and I think that is because the capitalist project is largely successful in these places, which is not to say that it isn't in other places, but there is, um, due to Anna saying some friction. Um, and, and I want to reduce what I found to friction, but uh, there is an element of economic, it, it simply does not pan out the way it is planned, which is why I talk about distorted discipline. So initially, I thought I would basically just find this typical in term, but um, it's distorted, which is again, not to say that it's completely appended, uh, you know, uh, because that would again be this romance of insurgency of infrastructures. It is not, it continues to, but it doesn't discipline the way it was meant to. It does get distorted. And that depends so much on local contingencies. So, I'll just read some of the questions from the Zoom room, um, and I'm trying to, to group them a little bit. Um, I think I can do that. Um, we have um, we're coming up on 15 minutes uh, remaining uh, or so. Okay, so. Um, Heather Davis uh, says, this is such exciting and interesting work. I love the twofold focus and the necessity for this bifocal relation to infrastructures. Can you talk more about the tension that you've highlighted between the necessity to standardize petroleum in the refinery and the multiple actors, agents, that influence within this process? We may have to a little bit in, in, in the answer, but let me throw in another one um, that, um, yes. So this is from uh, a guest named Julian. Uh, thank you for your fascinating talk, Sarinda. Your description of people infrastructure made me think that your work also contributes to putting into question separation between state and markets in public and private divide. Can you say more about how your research contributes to problematizing this divide in India and beyond, showing that this is perhaps a fluid border or maybe that there is not a border or separation at all? I was also reminded of a brokerage and Lisa Dorton is a wonderful work with many contributors on, on you know, I think her opening chapter also is someone she's waiting in her, uh, Lisa is waiting in her, her uh, partner to uh, help get in and LNG delivered to the house if I remember correctly. So uh, this may have uh, you know, question, I guess, I would add bro brokerage between these divides of public uh, Okay, and I'll, I'll get to the rest in just a moment. 
Um, thank you for those questions. So, um, yeah, you know, there were a lot of uh, contradictions. Uh, that's actually one of the main features of my analysis of what's going on in the family. It is actually a space riddled with contradictions, with assumptions, with imaginations uh, that, uh, that are actually, it, it functions uh, as if it has met those, um, those assumptions, but, but it never actually can. So, uh, for instance, uh, operations being completely standardized, uh, that's, that's never actually happening. A lot of the standards they set are local, non-international, and they, it's always a strife to meet them. So they're never truly meeting them. And you'd be surprised, even the products that we use are not all that standardized. So when I was in Natibur and you know, talking to people about these LPG cylinders, they say, you know, these are evaluated with water, which leaks out of the cylinders. And I thought that was impossible. And then in the refinery, I find out that's not water, that's naphtha, which is highly dangerous. But it's still being sold as LPG. And, you know, because LPG, once it comes out of the cylinder, should be gaseous. It's only in the cylinder under compressed conditions that it's liquid. Naphtha is liquid even when it comes out of the cylinder. So what's leaking out of the cylinder sometimes is naphtha, but it's being sold. So you know the, those uh, that there was that constant tension between um, meetings, having standards, assuming we've met them, functioning as if we've met them, but actually that always being a stride. Um, one of the things you know that struck me immensely, uh, and I'm quoting an engineer her who said. We don't have materials on Earth. Not, he said nothing is foolproof, leak-proof, and break-proof because for that we don't have materials on Earth. So you know, but they function, and there's accidents all the time in the refinery. All the time, we never get to know about them uh, because they're not always as massive. They don't always cost human life or limb, but they do produce toxicity and leakages all the time. This is common. And they are produce, they, they're functioning with uh, drains that are not working, with um, you know all kinds of uh, things that are actually not working properly, but they're still going on functioning to meet productivity uh, targets. So uh, it's you know it's it's full of these kind of contradictions. I call some of them uh, extraterrestriality because uh, of what this engineer said, we don't have materials on Earth. So the industry is literally extraterrestrial, not in the sense of like it's enormous, but in the sense that Earth does not have the materials to make this industry possible in the first place. Yet it functions as if it already has these materials. Same for humans, you know, functioning 24 seven. One of the examples I gave where an engineer is expected to travel through in the middle of the night and then when they're not able to, whose fault is it? You know, so and, and then like the amount of subjective experience that they rely on um, for like they have these uh, look, listen, feel confirmations, LLF confirmations, which they rely on very much for uh, the expertise of petroleum production, but they completely deny any kind of subjective experience or expertise that it's all just this objective technical knowledge and you know. So yeah, there's, there's loads of these kinds of um, tensions between standardization and um, I hope that answers Heather's question. Um, the other question was about people infrastructure uh, being uh, something about um, public uh, environment. Yes, uh, it contributes to the question of being separated between state markets and public and private provider. In other words, it's uh, a so I'm not sure if I will be able to do justice to this question. Uh, I never thought about the infrastructure of public or private. I think in India, that question doesn't come up so much, maybe. I don't know. Um, but uh, there's hardly an infrastructure in India I would see that is not really people that is fully, I mean, yes, of course, roads and families and bridges, but uh, infrastructures that are processual, that are not solid objects, but that are, you know, that have a temporality to them, often are people. So there is a replacement now in very small parts of the country 
or uh, pipe natural gas that comes straight into the kitchen. Uh, which is far less people, yes, uh, and therefore there's far less room for negotiation in, and, and room for sort of people to make their own arrangements outside of what the materiality of the infrastructure is offering. Um, but I'm not sure what this might say about public and private. Okay, I think I have a nice second word follow up. Uh, uh, one of the questions that I think today asked is, um, is, is the state somehow um, dependent on people to make it work, even if it is in formal or in legal ways, which ultimately produces its own informality in important ways. Um, so, yes, there is this desire to say to control um, the supply, i.e., not let it be monopolized by this informal supply panel, but in order to actually get things to work, um, you know, we still depend on people. Um. Yes, so I, I, I would say that the state requires or depends on the informality in case of the LPG black market. Uh, but definitely they work in, uh, there is a state sanctioning effect. Uh, the black market of LPGs in the city do not exist without that state sanction because the only providers of those cylinders are state agencies. So where are these, you know, half my time and that people went in this question of where are these cylinders coming from? And if they're in the black market, they are unaccounted. But how could they be unaccounted when there's a digital system of the state? So where are they coming from? So basically what I uncovered is there's a complete state sanction and involvement in um, creating these, these uh, informality uh, that alternate structures in foreign markets. But I wouldn't say that the state benefits, certain state actors benefit from it, but the state as an institution, but it also doesn't lose out. And that is why there's no motivation and will to stop the or prevent it, because there isn't a single institution or actor in the state that truly loses out from this black market. The only people who lose out are the poor people who have to buy the cylinders at double the price. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, then I'm going to draw upon, I think, two more questions from the, the chat, and then we'll be really close to that. We know that we may have time for one more in the room. Um, so, this is from Harkadar uh, Ramana, who says that uh, the sale of LPG cylinders to consumer citizens by the government implies the existence of a purchasing power in the base level of aggregate demand. What do we make of the picture of the countryside? Where LPG functions as among um, many communities who buy them and still want to use. Does it complicate the state's imagination of other consumer citizens? Um, I guess to use my well, what does it say about the distinction between rural and urban in the petroleum story in India? And then uh, another very short question from Landon. Uh, does the neoliberal character of the urban just be a conflict in this post to cut back? Um, so for Harshbarth's question, uh, I need to do the second project that I'm proposing before I can properly answer that question, which would be on the Pilhanmantri Yosuda Yosna, a scheme offered by the government of India to uh, which is this these, these cylinders that are offered to rural women below the poverty line. And um so I, I, I will not be able to answer that question properly, but what I do know is that it started as a very successful scheme, but it isn't because a lot of people in villages simply don't use those cylinders. They are, you know, they're imposed on them by the government. So once or twice they're incentivized in certain ways, or first in the street, blah, blah, they go and get it, but they never get the refund. Um, and they continue to use uh, other fuels like wood or dung or, you know, kerosene, even uh, things like that. So um, I'm not, I think there's a certain form of subjectification that happens differently, uh, which is far less in uh, rural citizens because of this than for urban citizens. And there's, there's a certain subjective disciplining of a rationing, creation of a rationing subject, of a surveillance subject, of a, of, of a citizen who's on the grid, who's purchasing, speaking of purchasing power, who's purchasing and therefore not a beneficiary, 
but you know, a good citizen because the citizen is buying from the state and it's making herself or herself themselves visible to the state through all the surveillance that goes on through the identity accounts. So that all of that comes with uh, and that's what I call the trolling citizenship, uh, which is I think far less uh, for rural citizens right now who are not using um technology. Uh, what was the second question? Oh, it was about the BJP government's uh, pledge to cut back on carbon emissions. Um, the, does the neoliberal character of the current BJP government conflict with the pledge? Um, I wouldn't say, I personally am not very sure about BJP's neoliberal character. Um, and I also, and, and that, all their pledges are anti-lecture. It's just that out there. So they, they also say all kinds of things about not being Hispanophobic or, you know, it, I wouldn't take it, their pledges seriously. Um, and there have been studies recently about uh, linking uh, fascism or right-wing politics to fossil fuels and to climate denial. Mm -hmm. And um, that's the spectrum I would put the Indian government on, not neoliberal or, you know, yeah. Hi, hi, Nana. Hey, I'm and so I really wanted to ask you, you can take us back to one of the contemporary movements that you're making that focuses on what you call our world family, and we spend a little bit on what your thoughts are around that. Thank you for the question. Um, okay, so this is, uh, these are basically, you know, when I was uh, doing the research in Nashville uh, with the Black Mountaineers. Uh, and I come back to what I was saying uh, in response to Aditi's question about, uh, you know, the state sort of sanctioning uh, this. So, so outlaw sovereignty is a form of personal sovereignty that these black mountaineers assert that they. Um, uh, it's not just about. There's a lot of literature on informality, improvisation, etc. in South Asia, and and illegality and crime. What I'm arguing is that what these people are doing isn't just that. It isn't just an illegal way to make a quick buck. It is not just about earning money through whatever means possible. It is very much about regaining their lost power. Because these Gujar men, the men of the dominant caste of that region, have been losing power to uh, urbanization and to like corporations that are now you know, uh, uh, Gurgaon, the city that I was doing the school work in, is, is, is now like one of the most popular hubs and things. And this village, it's an urban village that is turning into a working class neighborhood, uh, is, is right in the middle of that. So these men are not the ones who are getting jobs in those corporate offices and things, right? So they're losing their power, their land. Uh, so economically as well as socially, they're losing power. And, and this, this sort of um, illegality that they indulge in is not just about money. It's very much about asserting that power, which they think they're losing. And, and, and they do that through machismo, through masculinity. Of course, they get it from what caste has already afforded them for centuries. But the way they assert it is also through gender, um, through machismo. And, and so, to, to defy the state, to defy a power that is bigger than them, becomes a way of asserting their power. But it's always in cahoots with that state because they can't actually have this power without the state sanctioning it. So yes, it is outside of state sovereignty, it's a, it's a personal sovereignty, but at the same time, it's not questioning state power. Yeah. All right, well, we've had an extremely stimulating conversation today. It's difficult to imagine uh, a world without oil, without capitalism. It's difficult to imagine uh, that this is the last event of our academic year at the India China Institute, but it is. And I think we really we finished on the, you know, the highest of high notes. So 
Thank you to Sarah and to Rohan for the, the stimulating conversation this afternoon.